happy to have uh, Eric uh, Stubley from McGill University and is going to speak about glass groups, congruences, and top products. Uh, thank you, Payman, for the introduction and the invitation to, to speak uh, here in Toronto. Um, I'm actually a bit closer to you right now than uh, Montreal. I'm at home in Waterloo with my family, so nice. not so far away from actually being uh, at the Fields Institute. But nonetheless, uh, it's still happy to, it's still a pleasure to be here remotely. Um, throughout the talk, I, I want to really encourage you to ask questions. If you have questions at any point, um, I have the, the Zoom chat open on another window here. So if you want to put questions in the chat, I will see those and, and address them. Or of course, if you want to unmute um, and ask questions that way, I'm more than happy to take questions. So the plan for the talk today, um, I want to start off just by giving a bit of uh, background on class groups and some sort of classical results to set the stage for the new results that I'll be talking about. Um, the new results are our joint work with Carl Schaefer. Um, and so I'll spend a bit of time then talking about those new results and sort of new congruences that show up in, in our work. And finally, in the, the last part of the talk, I will walk through some of the ideas in the proof. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very concrete way of thinking about cup products in uh, group cohomology, Gawa cohomology specifically, um, and, and how that ties into uh, the stuff that we're studying. So um, just to sort of set the stage, um, the, the first classical stuff that I'll be talking about is class groups of cyclotomic fields specifically. Uh, so uh, if P is an odd prime number, P is gonna be an odd prime throughout the talk. Um, Q adjoined mu P, this is the P cyclotomic field, just added all of the P roots of unity to Q. I get an abelian extension of Q when I do this. Um, and then the basic object that I'm gonna be talking about is the class group of Q mu P. So um, this is the set of ideal classes of, of Q mu P mod principal ideals. Um, and what this is, it's a finite abelian group whose that, that measures how badly unique factorization fails in the ring of integers of, uh, of this field. So that's, that's the basic setting. And one of the very, um, I think, classical theorems that a lot of recent mathematics uh, stems from, and I think a very, very exciting result is Coomer's criterion. Uh, so this was proved by Coomer around 1850, sort of in, concert with, with Coomer thinking about uh, Fermat's last theorem and sort of how to get there by thinking about these uh, cyclotomic fields. So what this theorem says is that the size of the class group of this peak cyclotomic field uh, is divisible by P if and only if one of the Bernoulli numbers, even index Bernoulli numbers, B2, B4, all the way up to B P minus three, one of those is divisible by P. Um, so in particular, if you, if you care about the class group being divisible by P as Coomer did when he was trying to um, attack Fermat's last theorem, um, then you know, trying to figure out the class group directly from its definition as ideal classes can seem a bit intractable, um, but just checking whether some you know, finite list of Rational numbers is one of them is divisible by P. That's a lot more uh, sort of comprehensive, uh, com easily comprehended, like what exactly you're doing there. Um, so th this is a great theorem for for a ton of reasons. Um, there's this aspect of like taking a problem that looks very hard and reducing it down to to something a lot simpler. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of of really neat sort of mathematics. Um, in the, the 20th and 21st centuries that, that stems from, from this result. Um, so this is somehow, uh, I think a really great theorem and uh, a starting point to keep in our heads. And I'm gonna compare some other results against uh, as, as we go through the talk. Uh, I have a question about the remark you made before. Yeah. Um, so you were mentioning that one side is harder than the other. Is it, the, is it harder in general to compute the class number on the left or is it harder to compute the Bernoulli numbers on the right? Yeah, so the, the harder direction or, well, in some, 
in some sense, they are of equivalent difficulty because you know there's this theorem that tells you computing one is the same as computing the other. Um, but in terms of just, I think like the like the the simplicity of the statement, like what it actually means, what you would try to do to check the statement. Mm -hmm. um, on this side, computing the class group, if you start trying to do it by hand, like for large P, um, it can get out of hand very quickly and become intractable to try and compute this directly, like using ideal classes and like the Minkowski bound on um, like, you know, representatives of ideal classes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's much more practical, tracta tractable, and I think easier to think about, like, you know, there's a nice recurrence relation for these Bernoulli numbers. So it's maybe easier to think about doing by hand, computing these Bernoulli numbers and testing if they're divisible by P. Um, I see. Certainly you can get a computer to, to spit out both either side for you, um, no problem these days. I think the, another comment maybe on like how, which side is easier is, um, I, I don't have the exact numbers in my head, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure like the computer algorithms for computing Bernoulli numbers are quite a bit faster um, than for computing class groups. And like to compute class groups, the fast algorithms maybe need a um, like a GRH hypothesis, whereas the Bernoulli numbers is really just like, you could do it without any hypotheses. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so the setting for the new results that I'm going to be talking about, P is still going to be an odd prime. Um, and we're going to talk about something that is a little bit finer than just whether or not P divides the class group of some field. And that's, uh, we're going to study this quantity RP of, of F for, for a whole bunch of different fields F. Um, so what this RP is, rather than just if P divides the size of the class group, RP is how many copies of Z mod PZ fit inside the class group. So it's the biggest R such that Z mod PZ to the R is a subgroup or equivalently a quotient of the class group of F. Um, and the perspective that I'm gonna be taking throughout this whole talk really um, is because of class field theory, uh, which tells us that you know, there is a, a direct connection between class groups and abelian extensions of uh, the field in question. This RP of F is also the largest R such that there is uh, an extension E over F, which is unramified everywhere and whose Galois group is Z mod PZ to the R. So really we're actually gonna be thinking about abelian unramified extensions rather than ideal classes for the rest of this, this talk. Uh, but by class field theory, they're, they're the same. So this RP of F still uh, you know, measures things about both the class group and these extensions. The family of fields that we're going to be looking at this RP for uh, is the following. Um, so we're going to let N, capital N, be a prime, which is congruent to one mod P. And we're going to be studying RP of the fields where we adjoin a P root of this prime N. Um, if you're a little bit unhappy, maybe, with the fact that capital N is a prime number, um, the reason that this notation shows up, um, this work is sort of in a lineage of uh, work stemming from Mazur's Eisenstein ideal paper. Um, so N somehow started life as the level of, of a modular form. And the simplest case there is even when this capital N, the level is a prime is already very interesting. Um, and so the reason it's capital N here is, um, as we're gonna see, this is sort of in a lineage of that Eisenstein ideal paper, although, by now that connection can feel pretty indirect at times. Okay, so we're gonna study RP of these P through to N fields. And the first fact that I wanna start off with about them is that unlike the cyclotomic fields where sort of the baseline value of RP is, is zero, there's no real reason that uh, the cyclotomic fields always have a P part to their class group. Um, but for these P through to N fields, RP is always at least one. Um, so I wanna give you a quick sketch of that proof just to get our, our thinking uh, along the lines of unramified extensions that we're gonna see for the rest of the day. Um, so what we wanna to do to show that RP is always at least one in this case 
is uh, we want some uh, extension e over q adjoining the p root of n uh, with Galois groups n mod pz. And which is unramified. Okay. Um, well, the one sort of source of fields that we understand their Galois groups and ramification and many other things very well is the cyclotomic fields. Um, and the, the relevant fact here is that the nth cyclotomic field. Uh, This field has Gawa group uh, Z mod, the units uh, mod N, Z mod N, Z star. And since we're assuming that N is congruent to one mod P, um, that tells us that this group has a quotient of admit Z mod P, Z as a quotient. So there's some sub extension of this nth cyclotomic field that has Gawa group Z mod P, Z. Uh, so the, the E that we want uh, is the, the Z mod PZ sub extension of the nth cyclotomic field sort of base change to this P through to N field. So this B, big field extension here are joining both the nth roots of unity and the p root of n um, that has a sub extension that is gawa over um, the p root of n field with gawa groups at mod pz. Uh, and because the nth cyclotomic field is only ramified at n in infinity, um, we already have most of the ramification taken care of. So this is uh, unramified. Uh, away from our prime n and the infinite place. So then it's just a matter of checking that it's actually, in fact, also this field E is also unramified both at infinity and at n. Uh, so at infinity, this stems from the fact that the Z mod PZ sub extension of the cyclotomic field is part of the totally real subfield. And then uh, at n, uh, this follows from the fact that everything is, is tamely ramified, um, right? We're always talking about uh, degree p extensions and uh, our prime n is, is different from p. Um, and in fact, you can do some computations anatically to show that not only is it unramified, this extension is actually split at uh, the primes above n. Um, so there you have it. We can always produce in this setting uh, an unramified extension with, with Galois groups at one P. So the baseline value for uh, this RP is, is that it's always at least one. Okay, so I want to state, uh, no, I want to take a quick break for questions uh, before I get on to stating some more recent results. Um, so here, uh, I've cut the slide into two pieces and the top half of the slide um, here, this is just uh, a restatement of, of Coomer's criterion. Um, so rather than saying that P divides the size of the class group of Q mu P, I can rephrase that as, as saying that R of the cyclotomic field, RP of the cyclotomic field is at least one. Um, and what Coomer's criterion says is that happens if and only if one of these Bernoulli numbers is divisible by p or congruent to zero by p. Um, so in uh, 2005, Calgary and Emerton proved the, the following theorem when, when p is at least five. Um, and what this theorem says is that if this number uh, m, which is this 
sort of strange looking product of k equals one to n minus one over two of k to the kth power. Um, if m is a pth power mod n, excuse me, then uh, rp of this q adjoined pth root of n field is at least two. Um, so just uh, a couple of remarks. Hopefully the way that I've laid these two out here, they have a very similar flavor to them, right? Both of them are about um, you know, sizes of class groups on one side, um, being related to you know, some sort of congruence type conditions of, of rational numbers. Um, and again, both of them here, this is telling us, you know, RP is doing something interesting. It's above its baseline value. And it's the same condition here, right? RP is above this baseline value of one that it that always happens. Um, the conditions on the other side, this, you know, the Bernoulli numbers being zero mod P or the M being a P power, um, they sort of look a bit different. Um, in fact, you can rephrase them so that they look uh, more similar. Um, since N is one mod P, you can always choose a uh, discrete logarithm uh, from Z mod N onto Z mod P. Um, so this condition of M being a peak power is then equivalent to uh, it's log P of M being zero uh, mod P. Um, so this peak power condition, the one that I have here, and there will be a few more that show up throughout the talk. Whenever you see a peak power condition like this, you can always think about it as being an actual congruence condition of the type that's maybe more familiar after taking discrete logarithms. Okay, so hopefully that, that lines up these uh, two results. Um, but there's one very glaring exception to you know, this analogy between Coomer's theorem and Calgary and Emerton's theorem, uh, which is that Coomer's theorem goes in both directions. Uh, Calgary and Emerton only goes in one direction. Uh, so uh, put it up here. This is uh, maybe the question that my, my project with Carl and the results that I'm going to tell you, tell you about uh, we sort of set out to understand, like, you know, is there a converse to this theorem of Calgary and Emerton? One thing that you can think to do is just to start computing examples um, and see, you know, does it even seem plausible that a converse to this theorem is going to hold? Um, so already at the time um, when they were working on this, Calgary and Emerton computed uh, many examples when p is equal to five, um, right? You can get your computer to compute the p rank of the class group of, of these fields, and certainly you can check these congruence conditions. Um, so spe specifically for the case of p being equal to five, the data that Calgary and Emerton computed really suggested that the result was an if and only if statement. So for p equals five, the data suggests like definitely that is an if and only if, um, but there's more going on there. Um, because uh, Luc Couturier, um, in sort of related work more recently, uh, computed the following example of, of P being seven and being 337. In this example, uh, the seven rank of, of the class group of this field is equal to two. So there is some sort of non baseline interesting thing happening in the class group. But this quantity M, uh, is not a seventh power mod 337. So it can't be the case that um, Calgary and Emerton's theorem, just like the strict exact converse of that statement, um, is certainly not true when p equals seven and, and for, for higher p as well. It's not going to be true. Um, but you know, maybe there's still some hope because it looks like for from the data at least for p equals five, and it's true. Okay, so there has been some recent work on, on this uh, problem uh, of studying these before um, Carl and I uh, started our project on it. Um, Wake and Wang Erickson in 2017, as a part of their study of uh, sort of Eisenstein ideals, they gave a new proof of 
the Calgary and Emerton result um, that actually didn't doesn't appeal to modular forms at all. Calgary and Emerton's result does go through deformations of uh, Galois representations. Um, you know, it proves some R equals T theorem and understands that situation enough to sort of, as a consequence of some of their results, construct these uh, sort of interesting classes, interesting unramified extensions that give you things in the class group. Um, Wake and Wang Erickson found, found a new proof of this Calgary and Emerton result, but it doesn't appeal to modular forms at all. Um, and understanding their proof is actually going to be key to um, sort of the work that I did with uh, Carl on the converse. And uh, in 2018, Mukherjee um, has a very nice paper, again, studying these questions. He proves an upper bound on uh, the P rank of the class group of this uh, P through of N field um, that depends on uh, a certain set of peak power congruences that sort of look similar to, to this peak power congruence with M. Um, so the way this upper bound works is like, you know, there's, a, there's an absolute upper bound. And if some things are peak powers, you can reduce that upper bound um, and make it even smaller. Um, so the congruences that show up, um, these were first introduced by Luca Turier. Um, so we're gonna let SI be the following quantity. Um, it's the product from K equals one to N minus one of K to the power of the ith Bernoulli polynomial evaluated at K all divided by I. Um, so here's just the definition of these Bernoulli polynomials. Um, so maybe there's two things that, that I wanna point out here. Um, uh, well, actually I'll save one of them to the next slide, but I'll, I'll just remark that, you know, here again, we have um, not the Bernoulli numbers themselves, but these Bernoulli polynomials showing up. Um, so that's at least heartening that, you know, these congruences are gonna involve some kind of familiar looking objects if we're getting sort of a familiar theorem statement. Um, so let me not keep you in suspense and let me tell you what these SIs are used for. Uh, so here again are uh, our uh, two results that we've seen already, the, the result of Coomer and the result of Calgary and Emerton. Uh, and then for comparison, here is one of my results uh, with, with Carl Schaefer. Um, we're gonna assume uh, like Calgary and Emerton do that, that P is at least five. Uh, and uh, we're also gonna make the assumption here for to maybe give the cleanest theorem statement uh, for, for comparison here that uh, P is a regular prime. Um, in other words, the P rank of the class group of Q P is equal to zero, which as we've seen already is something that's controlled by congruences of Bernoulli numbers by Coomer's theorem. So what our result is, is it is a partial converse to Calgary and Emerton's theorem. So Calgary and Emerton say, um, if M is a P power, then the P rank of the class group of this P through of N field is at least two. What my result with Carl says, if this P rank is at least two, then one of these quantities, S2, S4, all the way up to SP minus three, has to be a P power, not N. So one thing that I think is handy to help, you know, make all of these very statements line up um, uh, here, you'll notice that, you know, this list of congruences doesn't have M in it, this, this quantity M that appeared in Caligari and Emerton's theorem, um, but sort of secretly it does in not in all an obvious way. Uh, but the, the fact that you need is that uh, M squared is equal to uh, one over S2 cubed, uh, at least up to P powers. So since, since P is not two or three, the, the fact of being a P power um, doesn't depend on if you square or, or cube your quantity. Um, so you really can think of M as showing up in this list in, in that it's, it's essentially the same thing as S2 when we're working with things mod uh, up to peak powers. 
Okay, so that that is our uh, the the statement of our theorem, and you know you can see that it really starts to fill in this this uh, dictionary between ranks of class groups and uh, congruence conditions, and that it gives it a, a form of converse to this theorem of Caligari and Emerton. Uh, just to come back to the examples that we saw earlier, um, when P is five, the this list of the, the SI numbers that shows up is, is really just S2. That's the only quantity on the list. So in that case, you know, combining Calgary and Emerton's theorem with our theorem, you really do get an equivalence. When P is five, the five rank of the class group of this fifth group of N field is at least two, if and only if S2 is a fifth power odd N. And then uh, when P is equal to seven, this example that we saw before with N being 337, uh, there, the seven rank of this class group is equal to two. Uh, I, I told you earlier that M and S2 are not seventh powers, but the other one of these quantities that comes into play here is S4. And in this case, S4 is a seventh power mod 337, which um, explains sort of where this uh, second dimension in the class group is coming from. Um, I think that is all I wanted to say about the theorem statements and these examples. Uh -huh. Let me take another uh, quick break for questions here, and then I'll move on to talking about some of the ideas in the proof of our result. I have a question. Uh, do you uh, do you think your statement might be if and only your theorem might be if and only if? Uh... Yeah. So that's 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 a a great question, and certainly. Um, because um, yeah, because you, know, you want this theorem to you... be filled in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in fact, our our theorem is not an if only if. We we know that it's not. Um, I'll I'll give you just one example right now. Uh, when p is eleven and n is uh, three fifty three, uh, the I guess it's r eleven of of this field. Uh, 11 through 353. Uh, this is just one. So there's nothing uh, above the baseline happening in the class group of this field, um, but S4 is an 11th power. Uh, so, you know, here, here's an example when P is an 11. P is 11. Um, we didn't compute examples for lots of other primes, um, but I, we understand exactly sort of where our result breaks down, um, like exactly where in our arguments, it, it is sort of becomes clear that this can't be an if and only if. Um, and I'll, I'll point that out again when we get to that part of the argument, like exactly what goes wrong for examples like this one. Thanks, very interesting. Um, other questions I can answer now. Um, so at the start of the talk, you were mentioning that uh, this question about class groups kind of was born out of Mazur's paper about the Eisenstein ideal. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you mind, uh, like, I guess, saying a bit more about how it came from that paper or how it was related? Yeah, so, so the way that it actually shows up, um, uh, let me go back to, to this result of, of Caligari and Emerton. Um, so what this, this paper, um, oh, I forget exactly what the title of this paper is uh, it has Eisenstein in the title of the paper. Um, so so this, this paper of Calgary and Emerton, they really weren't uh, like trying to prove things about class groups. What they were doing was reinterpreting Mazur's Eisenstein ideal paper from the point of view of deformations of Galois representations. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that they happened to, to prove along the way, uh, maybe I'll say something uh, here, Um, so what they uh, was it if the if the ZP rank of a certain cuspidal Hecke algebra was 
at least two, then because this Hecke algebra is controlling some deformations of Galois representations, you can use the fact that there are two dimensions in this uh, Hecke algebra to construct sort of enough representations to show that the like the RP of this particular uh, field is at, is at least two. Uh, I guess I should say this is a like a Hecke algebra of uh, forms of level n. Uh, so what they did was was just really working on the um, you know they proved some R equals T theorem for involving these Hecke algebras and they happened to notice the consequence that when it had rank at least two you can produce some Galois representations that that spit out these unramified extensions and then uh, sort of independently uh, Morel uh, had earlier proved that like this rank of t was at least two, uh, if and only if m is a p power, not n. Um, so that's why I say the, the link from the work that I'm talking about now to all the way back to this Eisenstein ideal paper is like pretty indirect um, somehow, and then it goes through like, Calgary and Everton noticed that, you know, you can get this nice consequence about class groups as a result of some stuff about heck algebras. Does that sort of give you the, the link back that you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me move on and say um, something about uh, how, uh, how, Carl and I proved this and, and sort of where these congruence conditions will show up. The idea is really to transfer this problem about class groups to a problem in group cohomology. Um, and the way that these congruence conditions are, are gonna show up is that they're gonna measure the vanishing of some cup products in Galois cohomology. Um, so there's a lot of just like powerful cohomological tools um, there's Euler characteristic formulas of Tate uh, play a big role in uh, what I, I refer to as the greenberg wiles Selmer group formula. Uh, maybe it was developed by Wiles in, in his work on Fermat's last theorem. Um, these are very powerful tools that you can use a lot of contexts. Um, and so they're gonna give us some sort of key inputs at various stages. Um, and one of the other nice things about sort of transferring this to a problem about Galois cohomology is that it's going to let us link back with uh, cyclotomic fields. Somehow these congruences are going to come out of cyclotomic fields at the end of the day um, because of the fact that we can do things very explicitly when we're working with cyclotomic fields. Uh, so here, uh, I would sort of want to lay out this flow chart of uh, how, how our proof works. Um, so if you remember the directions, uh, my work with Carl is going from having the rank of the class group uh, at least two. Uh, so we're going to pass through all these various intermediate things um, and end up with one of these congruences that one of these SIs is a peak power mod n. Uh, and going the other way, um, this was Calgary and Emerton's theorem. Um, and really what I want to talk through first is Wake and Wang Erickson's new proof of this theorem, because uh, their proof is really going to be the one that goes through the various steps that I have laid out here. Uh -huh. And so their uh, their work, and really in general, this direction is only for S two. It's not for the higher S i's at all. Um, and now we'll we'll see very viscerally why it only works for S two in, in a few slides. Okay, so what I want to do is. Um, I'll actually talk about this Wei Kuang Erickson proof, how you go from congruences all the way to class groups first, and then we'll see how to sort of unwind those ideas and go the other direction. Um, so to do that, I want to set up some uh, cohomology classes uh, just so we can refer to the various objects here. Um, so omega 
is going to be our uh, mod p cyclotomic character. Um, this is just the character that gives the action of the absolute Galois group of q or some uh, quotient of it on the p fruits of unity. Um, specifically, everything we, we talk about here, we're going to work with the, the Galois group of the maximal extension of q, which is unramified away from the you know the primes that are showing up in this story. So the set S is, is the primes n, p, and infinity, um, which are the possible places that we can have uh, ramification in this story. Uh, so the, the first cohomology class that I want to introduce is uh, this cohomology class uh, B that's in the first cohomology with coefficients in omega. Um, now by Coomer theory, there's a very explicit des description of what this uh, cohomology group is, and it's just a quotient of units. So it's in particular, it's the, the NP units mod uh, P powers of those. Okay. Um, so what this class B is, is well, N is certainly an element of this quotient of units, um, and B is just my name for the corresponding cohomology class. Yeah. Really, the, the way that I want you to think about B is that uh, B defines a Galois representation. Right, so it's going to define for us a two-dimensional Galois representation with uh, coefficients in FP. And it's given by taking some element sigma of this Galois group to uh, the following matrix. So B is some function that makes this map into a, into a homomorphism. Uh, so in particular, it's an extension of one by uh, this uh, character omega, it's the cyclotomic character. Uh, and for reasons that will become clear in the next slide, I'm going to put a blue box around this two-dimensional representation. Okay, so this uh, cohomology class, uh, everything is very explicit when your coefficients for cohomology are omega. Um, there's another cohomology class that I want to introduce. Um, here, my coefficients for the cohomology are omega inverse. Um, so unfortunately, it's, it's not quite so explicit in this case what the cohomology classes are. Um, C, uh, there's a unique class in this cohomology group that is split at P. So if I restrict to a decomposition group at P, C, that restriction of C is equal to zero. Um, so that's sort of how C is defined. Uh, similarly, C defines a two-dimensional Galois representation but here it's an extension of uh, one by omega inverse instead, put a red box. Uh, okay, um, so that's- a question from the previous slide, sorry. Yeah. Um, how do we know that, um, yeah, how do we know that uh, the Galois representation is two dimensional? Like where does the two come from? Um, so the two, uh, the, the reason is that there's a two is because the coefficients that I've taken for my cohomology classes here are, uh, this is a one-dimensional Galois representation, if you like. Omega is a one-dimensional representation. Right. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to interpret Galois cohomology, but always one of them is that when you have like cohomology with some representation rho, the cohomology class is a function that creates uh, an extension of one the trivial representation by that, that row. So a cohomology class for an n-dimensional representation is always going to define an n plus one dimensional representation as an extension of one by something. I see. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So the, the two here is because two is one plus one, uh, if you like. Uh, uh, OK, so we have these two cohomology classes, b and c. and uh, you know, because this is a cohomology theory, one of the things that you sort of always get for free is that there's a cup product operation on it. Uh, so I can take the cup product of uh, my two classes B and C, and that's going to give me something that lives in the H2 of, of this Galois group with FP coefficients, so trivial uh, one-dimensional representation with trivial action. Um, you know, you could go through the the definition of this cup product with uh, co-cycles and so on. 
Um, and it is maybe not incredibly enlightening what it means, but here, here is the way to think about what this cup product means. Uh, each of B and C corresponds to a, some two-dimensional reducible representation. The cup product of these two is equal to zero, if and only if you can glue them into a three-dimensional representation like this. So, so here, specifically, I've got you know, the representation cut out by C in the bottom corner here, and then not quite the representation defined by B, but a twist of it by the inverse of the cyclotomic character. Um, so that you know the the lower corner of this blue square is the upper corner of the of the red square, so that they they have this character in common, and you can think to put them into a common three dimensional representation. So so this cup product is zero exactly when there's some function star here that actually makes a representation of this shape exist. Okay, so the vanishing of cup products tells us about extending our cohomology classes into higher dimensional representations. Um, and that's where um, we're sort of gonna get some mileage and construct things in the class group. Um, specifically, you can actually figure out a condition that tells you when this cup product is zero. Um, uh, in our specific setting, this boils down to a question of, it's just a question about ramification locally at the prime end. Um, what you need is that somehow B and C each define uh, sort of Z mod PZ extensions of the peak cyclotomic field. And you want the ramification at N in those fields to be the same. Um, so uh, where our congruences are going to come from is using Gauss sums, you can sort of figure out what the ramification at N in this coming from this cohomology class C has to look like. Um, so, so the, the result there, this is the, the takeaway maybe, um, the cup product of B and C is zero, if and only if S2 is a pth power mod n. So the, the way that S2 shows up is like some computation with Gauss sums ends up sp spitting out an S2 that tells you about this, this ramification at C and that is equivalent to this cup product being zero. So Eric, could I just interrupt and ask, um, yeah. did, in, did you, you showed a formula, you showed us a formula for the SIs, right? In terms mm -hmm. of, K, K, but is there a way of understanding what those numbers are? This is, this is one of the things that I'm very interested in. I don't have a good way of interpreting like what the SIs are sort of supposed to be um, other than that they're the things that pop out of this, this Gauss sum calculation. Um, certainly maybe what one would really want in a situation like this is some analog of the fact that the reason the Bernoulli numbers show up in Coomer's criterion is because they're um, special values of the Riemann zeta function or L functions of Dirichlet characters or like related to those at least. Um, whereas here, certainly you want something like that out of the SIs, but I don't have an interpretation of them that, that gives that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly would be very interested to, you know, to find the right way of interpreting these SIs. Okay, so we can understand exactly when this cup product is zero um, by computing these peak power conditions with, with uh, S2 in this case. Um, and then when the cup product is zero, that tells us about the existence of uh, a three-dimensional representation sort of, of, of this shape. And the, the star that is the top corner of this representation, um, it's not actually unique. You can, you can modify it by, uh, you have some, some choice of, of modifications you can make to that. And it turns out that there's always a unique choice where this star ends up defining exactly the, the thing we're after, which is an unramified uh, Z mod PZ extension of this P through of N field. Right? And the way that the P through of N field shows up is that this cohomology class B somehow really is cutting out this P through of N field. So, so that's the Waken Wang Erickson's proof of uh, Calgary and Emerton's theorem. They understand this relationship 
between the cup product and the, the peak powerness of S2. And then they show that when this uh, three-dimensional representation exists, you can always massage it around so as to produce an unramified extension of the field that we're after. Okay, uh, so just to fill in all of that information uh, on the, this flowchart here, um, this relationship between congruences and cohomology classes, uh, this came out of Gauss sums. Uh, going from this cohomology class with some, you know, caring about the cup product with B to a higher dimensional representation. This came out of the cup product vanishing. And then uh, the field that we were after uh, ends up being contained in the, the field that's cut out by this three-dimensional GAL representation. Um, and then lastly, you know, this link that we've already seen between unramified extensions of the field and the class group, uh, this was class field theory. Okay, so the, the strategy to go the other direction now, so starting with something uh, in the class group and ending up with these congruences, um, we're gonna try and unwind all the steps of this Wake and Wang Erickson proof and, and see what happens. Uh, so the fact that we're starting with an assumption, excuse me, that uh, this, this P rank is at least two, um, that tells us that there has to be some unramified extension E over Q adjoined the P through to N. Um, it's not contained in this genus field. That's the, the sort of baseline one that we constructed using the nth roots of unity. Um, so what we want to try and do is recover, hopefully, the, you know, the representation that it came from in the sense of this Wake and Wang Erickson proof. And the way to do that is you take the Gawa closure of E. Um, so E itself is a Galois extension of Q adjoined the P through of N, but it's certainly not Galois over Q. So you take the Galois closure over Q, and then its Galois group turns out that it's, it is always the image of a representation, but it's not always a three-dimensional representation. In general, um, you can get very high dimensional representations. Um, and the, the shape of these representations, it's, it's sort of similar in that it's an extension of one by not this representation, cut out by B that we saw before, but actually a, a twist of a, a symmetric power of that representation. Um, so what this ends up looking like, uh, if you want the characters along the diagonal, there's, there's a one in the top corner and then sort of decreasing powers of uh, omega all the way up to you know omega to the minus n for some n. You actually don't have so much control over what n is. Um, but the one thing that you can extract from it is that, you know, there's always at least this bottom three by three corner. Um, so in particular, there's, there's some, you know, uh, this A is gonna be a cohomology class with coefficients omega to the minus N for some N. And the fact that it fits into this big representation, but really actually just this bottom three dimensional representation tells us that the cup product of B and A is equal to zero. So, so starting with an element of the class group, we actually can construct this big Galois representation and then get a cohomology class out of it. Uh, yeah, so we get this cohomology class A where the cup product of A and B is equal to zero. So in the same way that, that B and C both define extensions of the P cyclotomic field, um, this, uh, this A does as well. And then the cup product vanishing uh, is, is related somehow to the local properties at N, uh, how N factors in, in that field extension. Um, and then doing a similar computation with Gauss sums as, as we did for C, you can check that such a class A exists um, if uh, depending on the parity of N, you're gonna get one of the 
uh, one of two choices. If n is uh, odd, n being the dimension, or not quite the dimension, but the, the number that pops out of that big representation that was n plus two dimensional. Um, if n is odd, you're going to get that s n plus one is a p power mod n. And if n is even, you're going to sort of use some duality theorems in Galois cohomology and end up, uh, you can show that s p minus one minus n is a, is a p power mod n. Um, so the conclusion from that is, uh, here I've got it all written out. Um, so this was our, our steps going across the top before. And so here's what happens when we go uh, down the other way. The, the key step to you know, transfer this back to a problem about Galois representations is to take the Galois group of the Galois closure of that field. And then you end up showing that that really is uh, coming from some high dimensional mod P Galois representation. And then to reduce down from a very high dimensional representation to something more tractable, you look at the lower three by three corner. And that actually just gives you a cohomology class sort of that defines a two dimensional representation that you can understand again using Gauss sums um, as before. Um, so to answer a question that showed up earlier, like why my theorem with Carl is, is not an infinitely if, and we really know that it's not an infinitely if, it's because of this step that's restricting to the lower three by three corner. If you wanted this to be an if and only if, you'd need uh, somehow the condition that tells you not only the cup product with B is zero, but some higher massy product with B that tells you that A not only extends to a three dimensional representation, but like an N dimensional representation if its coefficients are omega to the minus N. So that's really why our, our theorem is not an if and only if. And you know, there are plenty of examples that, that show that that is very much not an automatic process. Okay, um, that I think is all that I have prepared to say. Um, thank you all very much for your attention and questions for the talk. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions now. Uh, let's thank Eric for a beautiful talk first. Uh, any questions? Uh, Can I ask a question? Same yes, way? yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, I wonder, I don't understand the details of what you said, but but I wonder whether there is a, in, in addressing this issue of um, the if and only if, if you could just go back one slide. Mm -hmm. um, one, is there more information you think in in the minors of of this representation? Um, you know, some some sort of some algebraic construction where you generated by minors that would actually give you an if and only if, rather uh, than just taking um, one particular um, uh, three by three um, submatrix. Yeah. So this uh, let me go back to my representation here. Um, somehow all of the all of the interesting information is is it's a question of like whether this cohomology class A that is just defining this two by two, really like you can extend it all the way up by, by choosing sort of the stars that go in this column. Um, because this whole, most of the representation is this big block here, which is just a symmetric power of, of this thing that we started with. Um, so somehow that you want a condition like the, the SI being a peak power mod N, is the condition that tells you that you can choose this star that's sort of one, one step up from A. Um, so you, what you want somehow is, is conditions that give you all of these higher, uh, like more stars that let you extend the representation into higher dimensions. Um, I don't know that it's gonna come down to anything about the minors of the matrix. Really the, the problem that you have in doing that is like here, you can get some information about this star because the, the field that this, that has been cut out by the representation so far is like, it's just sort of like a two-step solvable uh, extension of Q. So it's not so far away from being abelian and you can get some traction on it. But the higher and higher you go, the further and further away from being abelian this field gets. Like it is a solvable extension with more and more steps to it. Um, so getting any sort of traction on it 
uh, you know, the higher you go seems, seems very difficult. And I don't know that there's anything like the miners of this matrix, you don't a priori know that even any of these, uh, if I just started with an A that I know this cup product is zero, a priori you don't know that you can extend it any further than that. Um, I don't know if that is some discussion at least that is helpful to that. Well, my, my question was question of miners. Yeah, my question was vague to start with. And yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, that's somehow sort of the difficulty in starting with an A and, and trying to get an if and only if is you have to extend it and like understand some very non-solvable, uh, oh, sorry, very solvable, but very not abelian yeah. uh, field extensions in, in order to understand exactly when A will extend all the way to this high dimension thing. So uh, if, if, uh, while you're waiting, maybe I'll ask a question. I actually have a question and also a comment. So the question is sort of in a tangent direction. And uh, the question is, uh, so this was for the P rank being at least two. I wonder if there is like anything that can be said uh, for any sort of translation for what, the, what it would mean for the P rank to be at least three. Uh, like these yeah, are so, yeah. Um, in general, I think it's, so if, okay, I can, I can tell you some things. Um, for the P rank to be at least three, um, certainly it's a necessary condition that one of the SIs is a peak power, but in fact, you can get it with only one of the SIs because there's somehow always like two cohomology classes, like one for an odd N and one for an even N that, you sort of see through the same SI. Um, so uh, any condition for like RP being at least three is will be a bit subtle even for that reason. Um, I have one more thing prepared that maybe I will, uh, uh, I can say here. Um, our techniques actually give strong results for some small primes. So for, for P equals five, not only is our theorem an if and only if, like if we can tell you exactly what uh, the R5 is in this case. Um, so if you like for three, we can tell you exactly when R is at least three. Um, and that's controlled by uh, sort of the new thing that shows up uh, when R is one, S2 is not a fifth power. Uh, R is two, if and only if S2 is a fifth power and the square root of five minus one all over two is not. And then R is three when both of those are fifth powers. Um, but somehow this is very specific to the fact that this is P being equal to five. Um, our techniques don't give you similarly strong results for, for higher primes, for larger primes really at all. He also had a comment. So uh, I don't know if this is gonna be you know, helpful in sort of trying to get an if and only if statement, but uh, that the condition, you know, that, that sort of a that statement that these uh, two H one classes, you know, uh, you can get this three dimensional representation if and only if the cup product is zero. Mm -hmm. so that sort of fits in this general uh, framework, Rodin's framework of extension panache. So because you basically have two one extensions and you're trying to glue them into getting a two, uh, getting get getting a higher dimensional uh, object. Mm -hmm. And this cop product thing, uh, the reason it becomes cop product is because basically have you, these two one extensions and the cop product, the, you know, in terms of cohomology would be like the, you know, would be the, the, the Yoneda extension for the one extensions. Mm -hmm. And Grodendick says that, you know, you can, you can do this exactly when, you know, the, the Yoneda composition is zero. So I wonder if, you know, thinking, uh, you know, along that, uh, that line, maybe, you know, might be useful, uh, you know, in trying to get an if and only if statement. Yeah, yeah. Somehow, um, so I, I should say, like, there there is an if and only if statement that is, you know, the higher dimensional representation exists if and only if you get things in the class group. And it's really somehow the interesting thing is trying to extract like a numerical condition, like some congruence on the SIs. Um, that is the the hard part. So yeah, trying to Maybe somehow in this like Yoneda perspective, 
there's some new way that you can think to get um maybe maybe i'm just you know uh, yeah 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 trying to extract some interesting like these numerical yeah. things yeah. out of that uh, I mean, the only reason you, yeah. I said that is because, you know, we've been doing something recently that, you know, this sort of a uh, gluing thing also appeared there. And uh, hmm. yeah, so I was excited to see that here. And maybe there's some sort of, yeah. Yeah, great. Any other questions, anyone? Um, I don't see anything in the chat box. Uh, okay, if no one else has any questions, we'll thank uh, Eric again uh, for the very nice talk. Thank you.